Welcome to our third video in Chapter 2, in which we're going to look at the differences between accuracy and precision, two similar but commonly confused terms referring to measurements in science and in chemistry. In science, the accuracy of a measurement is determined by how close that measurement is to the actual value or the accepted value, what we call the accepted value, because sometimes in science the value may be in dispute, and so there is a certain accepted value for that, for that particular measurement. Closer is more accurate, so the closer your value is to the accepted or actual value, the more accurate you are in your measurement. Precision, on the other hand, is how close a measurement is, so we have a single measurement, to other measurements. So we're looking at groups of measurements of the same type. So in other words, what we want to do is get as close together a group of measurements as possible, so a smaller spread in that group of measurements is going to be considered more precise. Now in general, we're going to be dealing with numerical data, but for right now we're going to use targets as examples to illustrate the differences between accuracy and precision. In this first target, you can see that the, the hits, if you will, are all grouped together in that center bullseye. This is both accurate and precise. In this case, there's a small spread in the data, as I've indicated in the green circle, and the small spread is reduced, is made smaller by using what's called more precise equipment or improving your technique. We'll talk more about precision and equipment later on in this series. Spread such as this is due to what's called random error. Random error is measurement inconsistencies where these inconsist inconsistencies are basically slight differences in the way that either you read one particular measurement several times or the differences between how several people read a different measurement and we'll come back to this in our next video. We use averages to remove the effects of this random error and in general a, a good experiment should have an average which is right in the center right on that, that desired or expected value of the, of the data. In order to get this nice small spread Always use the smallest device or smallest piece of equipment capable of doing the job. In other words, we're going to have the most calibration markings, and we'll talk more about calibration markings in the next video. So, for example, if you wanted to measure 10.00 milliliters of a liquid, you're going to use a 10 milliliter graduated cylinder because that's what it's designed to measure. You're not going to use a 50 milliliter graduated cylinder or something like a 600 milliliter beaker, which, as we'll see, is really very imprecise. Alright, this next target, well this one is precise but not accurate. Can you see why it's precise? Well the precision comes in the fact that we have this small grouping. Now in this case this is indicating a consistency in technique. So in other words you're doing a really good job of what you're doing but there is some error which is causing your, your measurements to be off. This is called a systematic error. And this systematic error is usually due to either some bad design in the, in the procedure or more, uh, more often some sort of a misreading or a, or a, a calibration off in your equipment. This would be, for instance, if a rifle scope was misaligned this would give you a systematic error where you could get many, many targets at the same point, but you would have, uh, you'd be off from the bullseye. All right, we can also have in our lab miscalibrated or uncalibrated balances, and you'll see me at the beginning of every lab class calibrating our balances to make sure that we are reading them properly. And to eliminate the systematic error, we're going to fix the equipment. As I said, you're going to see me calibrating the, the balances. You can improve your procedure. And frequently during the labs, as, as part of the write-up, I'll ask you for your ideas as to what could be done to improve the procedure and maybe to improve your accuracy a little bit. All right, so you can see it's not accurate because the the average of the number is, is nowhere near our desired or accepted value. All right. This next, this next target 
is accurate in a way, and I'll explain in a moment, but it's definitely not precise. Okay, we can see that there's a, if we take the average, the average gives us something close to the accepted answer, the accepted value. So right here is our average. The problem with something like this is that the spread in the data is too large. This spread is so large that we probably have some, some sort of an error in there from either uh, equipment that's, that's not appropriate for being used or something in the technique or practice. And that would be something that we want to fix, something, some improvement in our technique or in our practice. And if you're going to be thinking about shooting targets, then this would be something that comes from uh, more and more practice, getting better and better at, at holding and shooting that rifle. Finally, we have something that is neither precise nor accurate. As you can see, the average is off and the spread is, is much larger than you'd like to have. In something, in a case like this, you need to both improve your technique and to check your equipment and your procedure and get rid of both your random and your systematic error. So we're going to be measuring accuracy in our class and we're going to want our error to be as close to zero as possible. In other words, we're going to be measuring the difference between the experimental data Experimental data is what you take and the accepted results or the accepted values or the actual values and we're going to be using a percentage of the accepted result as our guide point. Now I should say we're not going to be measuring precision in terms of the spread in the data or groups of measurements only because that tends to be a little bit more sophisticated than we want to get into. So accuracy is measured by something called the percent error, where the percent error, and this is an equation that's on your green, on your yellow sheet, sorry, not green sheet, your yellow sheet, and in percent error, we're going to take the absolute value, that's what these symbols are right here, don't forget about absolute value, of the difference between the experimental value and the accepted value, where the error itself, the book goes into this, I don't want to make too big a deal of it, but the exper experimental value minus the accepted value is called the error. And that is going to go into the numerator, take the absolute value, because we don't care about the sign. All we care about is the size of the error. And we're going to divide that by the accepted value, and we're going to multiply that by 100%. The reason we div divide by the accepted value is that we want to know this as a relative size. So this is relative size, relative to our actual accepted value. An error of 1 out of 100 is going to be a lot worse than an error of 1 out of 1,000. As I said, we take the absolute value because its sign is unimportant to us. We only care about the size. Let's do a quick example. We have an accepted value of the density of copper of 8.92 grams per cubic centimeter. What would the percent error be if a student obtains a value of 8.42 grams per cubic centimeter for the density of copper? So let's set it up. Start off the percent error equals here's our experimental value, 8.42 grams per cubic centimeter, minus our actual value or accepted value of 8.92 grams per cubic centimeter. Notice what that's going to give us is an absolute value of negative 0.50 grams per cubic centimeter. I'll leave out the units for now. Take the absolute value, so it's going to be positive 0 0.50. We want to divide by the accepted value. This is what you are supposed to get, or what you expect to get. And we want to multiply that by 100%, and we end up with a percent error of 5.6%. We usually want to get it within less than 5% error. Now it's your turn. You can practice. I'm going to pause the video and have you work out the percent error in the densities for three samples of gold, where the accepted value for gold is 19.3. Remember, at 19.3 grams per cubic centimeter, that's going to be in the denominator for all three measurements. Okay, so we're back, and hopefully you've got all of the percent errors calculated. For sample A, we have a percent error of 1.6%. The value for B is 2.1% error. And for C is 1.0% error. So of these three, which one is most accurate? Well, we want the one that has the smallest error. And so that means that sample C is the most accurate measurement. Again, its percent error is the smallest. You can also say, looking just looking at the 
the absolute value of the measurement that it is the closest to the expe expected or accepted value. All right, so that's accuracy and precision in a nutshell. Now we're going to move on in the next video to look at precision in measurements.